Okay, so like we said, uh, we're on handout number two in our Bible study, Imperishable Victory, Life, Death, and the Resurrection. Today, we're going to be talking about on death and dying. So last week, we had a little bit of introductory material. We looked at different ways that the world thinks about death. And then we ended with the ways that we as Christians think about death. And to summarize that briefly, Christians neither minimize death, nor assumes that death is good, or that death is somehow not an enemy of ours. But on account of Christ, we recognize that death is an enemy, but it is a defeated enemy. Christ has overcome death for us, and that's why he came. And so if death was serious enough that it required the, the lifeblood of the Son of God, then we should take it seriously, but we should also take great comfort that Christ has given us this imperishable victory through him, through his life, death, and resurrection. Today, though, we're going to look a little more closely into uh, some Bible passages that have to do with uh, the cause of death, the effect of death, and also uh, why it was that Jesus died, what he was doing. So uh, we'll, we'll move into all of that, but let's begin with a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for uh, the opportunity to gather around your word. We thank you for the opportunity to hear more of the victory that Jesus has won for us. And we pray that this would strengthen us each and every day, not with some sort of false hope or blind optimism, but with the sure and certain victory that he has won for us. And so we ask humbly ask your blessing this day. Amen. By the way, I, I did, uh, there was another housekeeping item that I wanted to be sure to address, which was, um, thank you for the appreciation. We appreciate your appreciation. Um, it was very kind. Thank you, Trish, for, for gathering that together for us. Um, I think my kids ate, ate my face from the cake. They said it tasted good. Don't know what that means. What's that? You had to eat yours? Oh, I'm sorry, Pastor Don. Oh, it was a good hat. It was a good hat, yeah. But uh, we are. Uh, I am thankful for the fellow church workers that I have the privilege of working with, Greg and Pastor Tom and Pastor Don, as well as all of our staff and, uh, and so many of the leaders and volunteers here at Christ our King. It's just a blessing. So uh, thanks all around. Greatly appreciate it. Okay, so let's look at the first topic on our handouts, and we're going to focus primarily on the cause of death. What causes death? As we know, death was not part of God's original creation. And by the way, let me just, I'm already going to be on a tangent, so here we go. Um, <clears throat> this, I think, is the biggest reason, you know, a lot of Christians try to shoehorn the theory of evolution into the Bible, saying, well, you know, science is telling us one thing, but it seems like the Bible's telling us another, so can we make the two fit? And we would say, no, that evolution is really, it, the, the theory of evolution is based on millions and billions of years of things dying from the very beginning, right? So generation after generation of things dying and, and uh, growing, uh, from that death into some sort of new form of life. And that really puts it at odds with what we read in God's trustworthy word, which is that God did not create death from the beginning. Death was a consequence of sin, as we're going to see. And so the theory of evolution uh, doesn't fit into what we read in the Bible. What God tells us was his beginning. Um, it, it, um, it, it doesn't fit. So anyway, that's just, like I said, a tangent. Um, there's a lot more that could be said about that, but that's not the focus of our study. Uh, but just as an aside, you know, to admit that, that the world had death from the beginning means to admit that the world had sin from the beginning, and that, that, just, doesn't, that just doesn't fit. So anyway, death was not a part of God's original creation. After God created mankind, he placed them in the Garden of Eden. Let's open up our Bibles to Genesis, starting in chapter 2. And um, could I have a volunteer to read those verses? Genesis chapter 2, 15 through 17. Melissa, 
That would be great. Genesis chapter 2, 15 through 17. The Lord God put Adam in the Garden of Eden to work and care for it. The Lord God told Adam that he could eat from any tree in the garden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The Lord told uh, the Lord God told Adam that if he ate from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he would die. Okay, thank you. So what was God's commandment? Don't eat from the tree. Yeah, so you can eat from all these trees. All this is created for you to help me take care of it, Adam. Uh, you, you are to help tend and, and have uh, good and godly dominion over the earth, tending to creation. However, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For the day that you eat of it, you shall surely what? Die. Now, of course, the standard question, and this is a good question. Uh, we just talked about it um, in confirmation, my confirmation class with the, with the students there this past week. Why did God put the tree in the garden? Right? Was God trying to tempt them or, or something like that? Well, the first ultimate answer is God is God. He can do whatever he wants. And whatever he wants is ultimately good. We can know and trust that even if we don't fully understand that. But I think we can actually say more than that as well. Before the fall into sin, could Adam and Eve choose, legitimately choose, both to do something good as well as to do something evil? Was that their free will choice before the fall? What do you think? Yes, I would agree with that. Yes. Sin had not entered into the world. They did not have a sinful nature. Their will, was they were made in the image of God. They had the ability to choose either good or evil. So by giving them a command such as this, what God was showing was, look, I, am, I have made you, I have made everything out of my grace. Here is my good and perfect world for you to enjoy and they are showing God's love by willfully choosing to obey that command and to love God in return, which they were able to do. If God didn't give them any choice of sin, could their love of God be truly called love? In other words, if they were made like automatons or robots and had no choice but to love and serve God, is that truly love? You know, think about a relationship with a friend or a spouse. If you're forced to love someone and you don't have a choice to, and it again becomes like an automatic thing, is that truly love? No. Love is what? A choice that you love someone. And so I think, think that in part shapes why God commanded Adam and Eve in order that they might demonstrate their obedience, their love towards God by obeying his command. And again, God's commands are not bad. God's commands are good. When God commands us to do something, it's our sinful nature that says, oh, you're oppressing me. But in reality, all of God's commands are him simply stating, I want what's best for you. And here it is. Here is my good and gracious will for you. It's in sin that we take this, these commands of God, whatever they may be, even today, and say, I want to do something different. And then when we do, that's not good for us. It leads to death and destruction. So again, it's, it's not like sin is ever good for us. God's commands are always good. And that's the same for, for Adam and Eve. Now, after the fall, we know that the human will was bound. After the fall, humans couldn't do anything but choose to sin. So there's a difference between our will before and after the fall. So we can't choose God. We can't choose to love God after the fall. That's what our sinful nature does. It's only on account of the Holy Spirit's work creating and sustaining faith within us that we are able to choose something good uh, towards God after the fall. Okay, so that's what God's commandment was to Adam and Eve. Any questions on that? Let's go forward one chapter then. We're going to read a few verses here. Um, 
could someone read chapter 3, verse 19? This is after the fall, and this is God's curse uh, to, to uh, particularly to Adam. Joseph, you have that for us? By the sweat of your brow, you will eat your food until you return to the ground. Since from it you were taken for dust you are and dust you shall return. Okay, I'll go back to you in just a moment because we have some other verses there in just a second. But what was part of the consequence of Adam's, that should, that's a typo, of Adam's disobedience? Okay, you're going to work for your food. Not going to be easy. What else? Death. Yeah. You will return to the ground. Remember, God created Adam means, by the way, ground or earth or dust. Adam was created out of the dust. And he's saying, on account of your sin now, one of those consequences is you are going to return to dust. By the way, when do we hear that specific phrase in our church here? When do you hear... Remember, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Ash Wednesday, when we literally put that dust upon our forehead, remembering the consequences of our sin is dust. But again, the focus of Lent, Ash Wednesday is the beginning of Lent. The focus of Lent is focusing on our Savior who saved us from such a uh, pronouncement. Okay, so one of the consequences is that Adam and Eve and humans are going to die. They will return to dust. Let's continue reading Genesis 3, 22 through 24. Joseph, could you read those verses as well, please? Where's... Oh, I got it. No, 22. Hmm. Let me see what I see. Twenty. Oh, here we go. I got it. <laughs> I was hoping to get out from under just by reading that one verse. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And the Lord God said that man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take um, also from a tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. Mm -hmm. After he drove man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden a sheriffim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to the guard the way to the tree of life. I stopped. That's it. Thank you very much. I see you did that very nicely. That's why I called on you. Thank you. Okay, so what was preventing Adam and Eve from continuing? Sorry, what was God preventing Adam and Eve from continuing to do? Eat from the tree. Which tree? The one that they ate from originally and the tree of knowledge of good and evil? The tree of life. Now, why the tree of life? Didn't want him to live forever. That's what they said, right? Unless lest he reach out his hand and also take of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Now, we've talked about this before, but I just want to remind you, was this a punishment from God preventing them from doing that or an act of mercy on God's part? Mercy. Why was it an act of mercy? Had they already sinned by this point? Yes, so that they wouldn't live forever in sin. You see, what was being introduced into the world for the first time was death, was sin which causes death. All the dysfunction and sorrow that this world has, this, you know, that we look around us and we see at, on account of human sin and the creation groaning as the Bible says, waiting for the day of redemption, all of this would have continued on. And if Adam and Eve were still eating from the tree of life as they had been before the fall, they would live forever in that sorrow and misery. So we actually, this is an act of mercy on God's part that he would not 
uh, force them to continue living this way. Now, back in Genesis 3.16, uh, God does promise the Savior. It's the first promise of the Savior when the seed of, of, of Eve was promised to come and crush the serpent's head, uh, even though his heel would be struck. And so that, again, we say is the first promise of a Savior. So God has promised a Savior to save them from sin and death. But in the meantime, God was not going to allow Adam and Eve to live perpetually in this uh, a state of sin and, and um, a sorrow that was caused. Okay, so does that make sense? All right, um, let's do a little, let's do five minutes of table work here. At your table, if you would look up the next three verses, Romans 5.12, Romans 6.23, James 1.15. And what do the following verses teach us about sin and death? So for five minutes at your table, if you would uh, answer those questions together and uh, do that together, that would be great. Let's take one more minute, one more minute.
Okay, let's come back together. Hopefully you had a chance to look at each of those verses. If not, we'll talk about it here. Who would like to share what their table found out about sin and death from Romans 5.12? What did we find out about sin and death from Romans 5.12? Sin is death, okay? Okay, everyone is now sinning. Yep, so it says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, who's that one man? Adam. And death through sin, so sin is death, as Joseph said. So death spread to all because all sinned. Pastor Don? We think COVID is bad. Now, that's actually a, a, a great segue because the way to think about sin is we inherit sin from our parents. And if you have children, you've passed on sin to them. It's like this disease that's hereditary that can't be escaped. Oftentimes, when we think about sin, we think first about what we either think, say, or do. In other words, like sin in action, and we'll get to that in just a moment. But actually, we realize that before we even do sin, active sin, there's this thing called original sin. This is the disease that we've inherited from our parents, passed down every generation since Adam and Eve. And it's like a disease that's infected us, and it results in symptoms, right? Diseases have symptoms. So the symptoms of the disease we all have are the active sins that we do, the thoughts, words, and deeds of sin. But before those even come into being, again, we, we talk about how we've all been corrupted by our, into our very nature, our sinful nature. And so this is what this verse is getting at. Let's look at Romans 6.23. Who would like to share what their table found out about sin and death from Romans 6.23? It says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What do we learn there? Yep, eternal life comes through Jesus. Why did Jesus come? To save us from sin. And it, you know, it uses this language of wages. What's a wage? What you get paid. So in essence, you've earned it. Right? A, a gift is not something you've earned. Otherwise, it ceases to be a gift. A gift is something by definition you haven't earned. But a wage, a wage is something you've earned. So according to this verse, what have we all earned? Death. But, of course, the gospel good news is that the free gift, that, that phrase is in that verse, the free gift. In other words, something you haven't earned and couldn't earn, the free gift of God is eternal life. So God provides the answer, and the answer has to be free. You know, God can't say to us because of our corrupted nature, well, work harder, would you? Do better. Do more. Earn this salvation. We can't. It has to be a free gift of God's grace, and it is. So that's crucial. That's crucial. How about James 1.15? What did we learn in James 1.15? Who'd like to share what their table talked about? Nancy? Once you say that again. Once you start thinking it, you're toast. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so it says, Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, bring forth death. So you're saying, once that thought, that sinful thought, is there, you're toast, right? Because it only snowballs from there. Yeah. What else do we learn from this verse? It's using birth 
imagery, isn't it? Right? Conception. Um, a full, you know, birth, something being fully grown, almost like it, sin is our child. But it starts off with what? What's the first thing? A thought or desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. Which indicates that, again, sin comes before the thing we actually do. Sin is what we are infected with that affects even our desires. What we want in life isn't even ordered properly. You know, without God's intervention, what we would want in our lives is sinful and is apart from God. We do not want what God wants on our own. And when that desire is conceived in us, it gives birth to sin, the things that we do. And of course, that sin then brings forth death. So, is sin serious? You bet. It's a terminal diagnosis. And there is no cure except for Jesus Christ. But we'll come to that. Okay, let's talk about the effect of death on our body and soul. Would someone please read Ecclesiastes 12, 7? This is going back to the Old Testament here. Ecclesiastes 12, 7. You have that, Mike? Thank you. Yep. And the dust returns to the earth as it was, and the spirit returns to God who gave it. Okay, thank you. Dust returns to the earth as it was, and the Spirit returns to God who gave it. So, what happens to our body when we die? It turns to dust. Yeah. By the way, a lot of people have questions about um, cremation and burial. We'll get to it. We won't get into it right now. But that is something we plan to talk about in this study. But our bodies, when they die, return to dust. Whether we are cremated or buried in body, our bodies return to dust either way. And this, of course, calls back to Genesis 3.19. From dust you have been made, to dust you shall return. What happens to our soul or spirit? Goes back to God, okay? So the saints, those who have faith in Jesus, return to God. Where do the souls go? This isn't in this verse, but where... Do the souls go who don't believe in Jesus to hell? In either case, the soul is separated from the body. Is that the way God made us to be? Soul separated from body? No. And actually, this is going to be something we're going to come back to a few times in this study. That's actually very unnatural. By definition, we as human beings, going back to Genesis, are the ones made in the image of God into whom God created his or breathed his life-giving spirit. God made us to be body and soul together. You can't do something right now in just your soul or in just your body. Like I can't go do five jumping jacks with just your body but not your soul, right? It doesn't work that way. Who we are is body and soul together. Now, when death occurs, unnaturally, death and soul split up. And we do take great comfort knowing that like the, the soul of our loved ones who have died in the faith are with the Lord, and that is good. But that's not the end of the story. And we don't want to stop the story there. Because God has to and will bring us back together again in the resurrection where body and soul come back together. Again, I'm jumping ahead, but I'm giving you a little bit of foreshadowing of where we're going. So it's unnatural that we're split up in body and soul when we die. Would someone please read Matthew 27, 50? Brenda, thank you. Excuse me. <clears throat> And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Okay. So who else did this happen to? 
Was his body and spirit or soul separated when he died? Yes. You see, we, as Hebrew says, we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. Whatever we go through, Jesus chose to go through for us. Now, our, again, this is jumping ahead a little bit, but is, are Jesus' body and soul back together? Yes, they are. When he rose on the third day, that is the resurrection that he will inhabit forever. Isn't that interesting to think about that Jesus is living in the resurrected body, a human body for the rest of eternity, and he chose to do that for us? And when we are raised from the dead, we too will live in an imperishable body and soul as well. If you have questions about the resurrection, again, that's one of the topics we'll talk about, so we will get to it. But I just want to point out that Jesus also suffered through this effect of death on our body and soul, which is that they are separated. And Jesus had no sin. That's right. So the reason why Jesus died, even though he was sinless, was because he took all of our sins upon himself. The book of Galatians says he became a curse for us on the tree. So the perfect one, the sinless one, chose to take all of that upon himself and in exchange gives us his righteousness. So he did that even though he was the only one who didn't deserve to so that we would be saved through him. Okay, now I'm leaving out right now what happens when someone dies. So on the point of death, we will cover, well, what happens when someone dies? That's not our focus today. Our focus is just the effects of death on body and soul and so on. So we will cover that. I'm just making you aware we're trying to stay uh, one topic at, at a time here, okay? All right, so let's talk more about the death of Jesus. So death has a claim on all of us because we all sin. Romans 3.23 is the verse that says, for all sin and fall short of the glory of God. But Jesus, as we pointed out just a moment ago, Jesus had no sin, and so the grave had no claim on him. We can't choose to have the, for the grave to have no claim on us on our own, but Jesus could because he was sinless. So through Jesus, death lost its claim on us because the cause of death, sin, was paid for by his perfect sacrifice on the cross. And what's more, Jesus rose again as the sure sign that he will raise us as well. So what Jesus did for us, as we were just talking about, is crucial. Let's go to Romans 5 again, this time verses 6 through 11. And would someone be willing to read those verses? Romans 5, verses 6 through 11. Sue has it up here. Thank you. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for a good person, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if while we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this so, but we also boast in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So what is it that bridges the gap? This, these verses use the word reconcile us. What is it that bridges the gap to God the Father for us? Yes, the death of his son. Verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled by God by the death of his son, to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. So in other words, Jesus' death paid 
for the sins, paid the wage that we owed. Remember we talked about we earned death? We earned death by our sin. Jesus paid what we owed by his death. And now that he is raised, and now that we are reconciled, the gap has been bridged, we now will share in the life that Jesus won as well. If you look at verse 10 as well, and also verse 6, what was our stance toward God when Jesus did this for us? What does verse 10 says? While we were enemies. And look back at verse 6. While we were still weak or powerless, and Christ died for whom? The ungodly. You see, it's not that God looked down and said, ah, oh, well, they're trying their best. Or, ah, oh, you know, they're pretty good. They just need some help. Or, ah, they're halfway there. I'll get them the rest of the way. God made a decision in love to save us by sacrificing his own son when we were actually his enemies. We were opposed to God. That's what sin is. We were opposed in our nature. And our nature, without God's intervention, does not have any capacity to move towards him. And this is contrary to the way that some people talk or, or believe that Christians can make a choice for God or can, you know, make a decision or can kind of go halfway and God gets them the rest of the way. There. Some Christians believe that or some Christians talk that way, but this is not the way that Scripture talks. Before Christ intervenes in our life, we have no capacity to be anything other than God's enemy. But you see, that's what makes the gospel so astounding is that even while we were his enemy, Christ died for us. He chose to make that sacrifice for us. And this brings us great comfort because when we're racked with guilt or wonder, well, God, can God forgive me? Or am I really lovable by God? You read a verse like this and say, well, while we were still sinners, while we were the ungodly, while we were the, the enemies of God, he chose to give up his son. And even more so now, that he will continue to forgive us. We don't want to water down the gospel because the gospel is so good. Does that make sense to everyone? Okay. Let's look now at Romans 5, uh, same chapter, Romans 5, 18 through 19. Would someone read those verses, please? Laurel has that. Thank you. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners. So by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. So that as sin reigned in death, grace also must reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Okay, thank you. So whose disobedience is referred to in, um, especially verse 19? That's Adam's. And what was the result of that disobedience? Yeah, many were made sinners. And if you look at verse 18, one trespass led to the condemnation. So we're made sinners. We were condemned by God. We were uh, left in death. Okay, so then whose obedience is referred to in verse 19? Obviously, that's Jesus. Jesus obeyed the Father perfectly for our sake. And what's the result of that? 
many will be made righteous. So we inherit this disease of sin and the consequence of that sin, which is death, from Adam. But Jesus came, often called the new Adam, the second Adam, uh, the one who reversed what Adam brought on, which is that he did what we could not, which was to be perfectly obedient and therefore granting us as a free gift his righteousness. Okay, let's, any comments or questions on that? Let's look at Hebrews 2 then. And interestingly, these are the verses that uh, follow our epistle reading today in church. We stop at 13 in church, but this is, these are verses 14 and 15. Would someone read those two verses, please? Joyce, thank you. Mm, I lost it now. It's um, 2, 14, 15. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity, so that by his death he might destroy him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Okay, thank you. So verse 14, what did Jesus partake of? I heard you say his, our humanity, our flesh and blood. Again, there isn't anything that we go through that Jesus doesn't go through. He became one of us. And why did he do this? What does verse 14 say? It says, so that through death, which means Jesus has to what? Die. Through death, he what? Would destroy the one who has the power of death. That is the devil. Now, that's interesting. These, this verse says that the devil has the power of death, which is the devil. What does that mean? Verse 15 helps explain that. What does it say? What is our relationship with death according to verse 15? Slaves, on account of a fear of death, right? Isn't that what verse 15 says? Now, that's interesting because last week we talked about the world's way in which it thinks about death. And this is saying that unless we have a God who intervenes for us, we can't help but be slaves to death because we are always afraid of death. And so that fear of uh, uh, enters in. And, um, you know, whether we believe in God, and maybe that fear of death looks like, well, what will happen to me when I die? What will God choose to do with me when I die? Or if we are a person that doesn't believe in God, uh, I'm just thinking of hypothetical people out in the world. And so our fear of death looks more like, well, I've got to do everything I can to stave off death so that my life now, since I don't believe in anything to come, my life now can be as full and complete in this world. Um, humans are subject to that fear of death. And the devil knows this and makes use of it to have us fear, love, and trust in anything other than God. You know, if the devil can get us to be afraid of death, then we will start to do things that look different than if our fear, love, and trust were perfectly in God. But since Jesus destroyed, uh, since Jesus died for us, back to verse 14, he, this, what does verse 14 says? He destroyed the one who has the power of death, that is the devil. So Jesus releases us from this slavery. Jesus releases us from having to be afraid of death. Jesus releases us from anything the devil tries to convince us that he has the power to do in our lives. And he did so by dying for our sake, by becoming one of us, by partaking in our humanity.
Any comments or questions on that? Okay, um, I think this is a good place, place to uh, hold. Next week, we're going to look at what death becomes on account of Jesus. And there are some interesting ways that the Bible describes death for one who believes. And so we'll look at that next time and then move into the next uh, uh, topic as well. Again, if you have any questions, you can place them in the white box up here to my right. Um, things you'd like me to address either privately or within our class, that is fine. Uh, thank you for partaking today. And, uh, oh, I forgot to ask you to sign in on the attendance sheet if you haven't signed in on the attendance sheet. And then um, let's uh, close with a prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, into our life and into death itself, that he might destroy these enemies of ours that is sin and death, so that nothing would separate us from your love. We thank you for this good news. And as we go out into a world that is living in fear of death, perhaps, that we might help reflect the light that you have now given us through Jesus uh, to them. We pray all of these things in his precious name. Amen.